So the other example comes from a household survey in Liberia. And uh, you can see they were lucky they did a survey before the Ebola outbreak and they repeated after the Ebola outbreak. And you can see how the consumption of bushmeat decreased them dramatically after the outbreak. So people were afraid, so they started to eat more chicken and more fish. The other ones didn't change so much. So in a way we can see that at least in urban areas there's a potential for raising awareness about even the, how healthy it is to eat certain types of bushmeat. Another survey, this time is around Serengeti. And I want to challenge our colleagues from Tanzania because this survey showed that local communities living around Serengeti, the main source of protein is bushmeat. Mm -hmm. yes. And why would expect that this is one of the oldest and most famous, and we can even argue better protected um, areas in Africa, and people living next to it. Although in some areas they're pastoralists, the main source of protein is still bushmeat. So I think it's good to acknowledge that bushmeat is a big ecosystem service, very important in some areas, so we need to investigate what's going on, which species, which numbers, and maybe try to find a solution well, for, for it. And uh, this study was very interesting because it also raised the point that um, if people become wealthier, they would eat more protein. As I said, people, when you have money, now you can afford meat. And if the cheapest available among your meats is bushmeat, then you can afford more bushmeat, which might become a problem. And the second point that they raised, and I thought it was really, really important for a country like Tanzania, is that if fisheries collapsed, you know, in most, unfortunately, most of the world, there's a problem with overfishing as well. Then if fishes collapsed, which was the other source of protein, people would turn also into bushmeat. And uh, there's another study done in Ghana that shows a similar thing. I mean, I, I didn't bring it up, I forgot actually at the end. Which shows the same thing. There was a year where there's some problems with the fishing. I think it was some more political than anything. And then people turned to the forest for bushmeat because fishes were no longer available. So one who needs to think about that as well is just when something happens, people turn to the forest or the woodland or whatever you have for out there. So uh, in this study, they, they suggested that the solution was to increase the price of bushmeat. That's okay in a city eh, where you can do that, but in a rural area it's hard if it's already kind of the cheapest available. And the other one was to try to reduce the cost of the alternatives. So people can afford cheaper things and might not be as interested in bushmeat. Um, but uh, if you increase the price of the bushmeat, those who are going to sell it will get more money, so more people want it. Well, but maybe not everybody will... It's a good question. So the question is like, if we increase the price of bushmeat... Sorry. Yes, more people would go and hunt it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, but also more people will not be able to afford it, so maybe the demand will also decrease. So it depends. Is that like any commodity? It depends on the context. So now we go into, okay, we know what is out there, what people are consuming and why. Now we go and see how uh, it is the effect in the, um, in the population, eh, in the wild. So this study was done in, in uh, Korup National Park at the border between Cameroon and Nigeria. And they looked at seven species of monkey and they found that the the number of monkeys was different between, I mean, sorry, the, the, speci the abundance of the different species was different between the hunted and non-hunted areas. The question is, why? It's not that the, the, in the areas that were hunted, it's not that the, the so let me, let me frame it again. Eh? So you have two areas, one that is protected and one that is not protected or maybe not effectively protected so there's more hunting. Mm -hmm. So in one area you have monkeys, in the other one you also have monkeys. But the species are different. Mm -hmm. Why? Preference. Yeah. For hunting? Yeah. For, yeah, for, the, for the species. Or maybe some are easier, they tolerate more hunting. So in this case, the red colobus monkeys 
were very sensitive to hunking. It just eats a certain type of fruit, it doesn't eat leaves, so it goes in very big, large groups, so it's easier to become overhunted. So that's why I say, eh? I mean, it's not that all monkeys are the same, eh? or all dikers are the same, or all antelopes are the same. The way that they have different um, group sizes, also if they are nocturnal or diurnal, or the diet they have has an effect on how things get overhunted over time. Eh? So another survey, this time is, um, oh, this is across Africa, this one. So this one, uh, it's quite cool as well. They developed this index looking at the population density of certain animals, um, 141 species, which type of habitat, how rare they are, they, uh, um, their diet, and they come up with this funny index that I don't want you to remember, but it's just to show that it looks very fancy. And what was the hunting potential? So could it be sustainable to hunt in this area and which areas are more at risk? And the only thing that I want to show you is this map. So they, they try to see which areas species were unlikely to be overhunted, which areas were very likely to be overhunted, and which areas it depend on the species itself. And um, anything that comes up from looking at the figure? I mean, I think the area where most species would not be overhunted is again mostly Gabon, where I already said that a lot of people live in the cities, more urban areas, and also population density is lower. And I think for the central part of the figure, they didn't have enough data to, to run their models. So that's sometimes another problem. So what can we do? And I'll give you two minutes to think about it. So the first one is like, can we really stop bushmeat hunting? Because the study from Serengeti says that, hey, if they cannot manage in the Serengeti, how can a small protected area in DR Congo where governance is very low and resources are so low and they have not even any tourists to finance this, can even think that they'll ever stop that? And then the second question I have for you guys is actually fair to do so. Because in areas where there's no alternative for bushmeat, are we really have the right to condemn the local communities to all the diseases and malformations that come because of not having some of these nutrients. And um, I just want to give a hint that um, Rodrigue, my colleague from Congo, is working in uh, Lomami National Park in central Congo, and bushmeat is the most important forest benefit for the local communities. So in this case, think about it. Should we really tell them to stop it? So I'll give you two minutes to think about it, and then maybe we can get a couple of comments. Also, it might be context-specific, eh? Maybe in some countries, we have more, maybe in the savanna, we have more options for alternative sources of protein. Fish, and I like to think about also caterpillars, edible insects, eh? just that you know. Uh, some of the caterpillars, they have more protein than beef. Yeah. <laughs> they reproduce faster. You can have a lot in a small surface of land if you have the right trees or uh, the right uh, plants. So maybe this is an opportunity as well. Or maybe in the areas where they do uh, bushmeat hunting for income to pay the school fees, maybe we could help some of these people get into like selling honey or maybe cash crops. So just give it two minutes and think about the problems of bushmeat in your country and maybe you can get two or three examples from around the room. I talk a lot about the Central Africa because that's where mostly I work, but as we saw from the paper of the Serengeti, it is not just limited to the rainforest. Eh? And of Central Africa, this is a problem all over. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think that uh, uh, we can not really stop uh, hunting uh, or preventing local communities to get uh, bush meat. The most important thing is to know really what if what they, they need to hunt is there. We, we need to have information on what if what the communities need is there and then, then allow sustainable hunting. Mm -hmm. So we need information on what they prefer and also the ecology of the species. What is the density, how often they make babies. And this is a big problem for many species eh, that we don't even know how, what is their feeding habit. I mean, not for gorillas or the biggest well-known, eh? some of the less known species, we don't even know how long is the gestation period, how, many, how long they take to make babies and how many they have. So 
it's very important before we can determine if it's sustainable or if it should be allowed is to know what is the ecology and biology of this species yeah yeah mm -hmm. another comment I, I don't know how i can put it regarding the stop bush meat hunting given the current situation right now in tanzania especially with this regime of magufuli whereby poaching activities have almost gone down mm -hmm. now there's a new problem lots of wildlife now raids people's crops uh -huh. so recently the minister of natural resources and wildlife whatever uh, came up with a new plan of hunting all the animals outside protected areas and sell them on auction so to me uh, i would say we cannot stop bushmeat hunting but rather find a way of dealing to with regulate, the, yeah, it, yeah, eh? regulate it i think it's a very good point eh? and I, I this is a common common uh, of people living next to protected areas where there's big wildlife eh? yeah. mm -hmm. the animals you know they move eh? mm -hmm. so it means they also go outside yes. especially during droughts yeah. or when the crops are ready to be harvested the animals go out and they destroy the crops and then the local community say, well, if now I have no crops to eat, let me at least kill the animal that ruined everything to have something in my stomach, yeah. which in a way makes sense. But I think it's a very good point that in some areas where wildlife numbers have become so big, yeah. then they actually become a problem because they start to go out and destroy people's field. And people say, well, at least I could eat the protein. It's not that I'm going in. I'm just, you know, getting something from my ruined crop. Mm -hmm. Good point. Another comment here? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have an opposite feedback from him. Good. That's why we are here. Yes. To talk. I think the, we have to look on uh, the context mm -hmm. and the country itself, not uh, saying immediately that we have to stop. It's very important. So context because, is very important. Yes, I agree. Yes. If we are in a country like Tanzania or like Congo, where they have a big country, big, big areas with so many animals, I think for them the, the most important is to regulate mm -hmm. how people have access on those animals, mm -hmm. which animals are more targeted, uh -huh. and then how can they, we make it yes, sustain? How can we manage it? Yes, mm -hmm. good point. Now coming back to the country like mine, one. Mm -hmm. Small country, small protected areas, few weird animals, mm -hmm. big population, and then if we say that we allow people to hunt mm -hmm. these animals, you may find within one week Nothing. all the animals are over, mm -hmm. which is a challenge for me. So in our context, we have to look for other alternatives mm -hmm. that can help local people mm -hmm. and replace the food they are getting from with the animals mm -hmm. and then we protect the animals maybe mm -hmm. we allow them to hunt once a year mm -hmm. or once six months we regulate yes. yeah yeah we, we regulate, regulate depending on, on the numbers on yes. the numbers mm -hmm. of the animals availability and then we restrict which animals have to be hunted mm -hmm. and i think i think it's a very important point that is coming up here is that we need to know what we have in which numbers yeah. mm. and then we can regulate yeah. the hunting good yes. any other comment mm -hmm. some other comment yeah. yes from ghana yeah. okay. <laughs> i just said the policy for regulation is very good the, the other alternative is also provide uh, other alternatives for the local communities for income yeah or for income food also and maybe. also for the meat mm. so if protein uh, yeah yeah, they don't have uh, like livestock at their places. They they can be like told or like there can be education for mm -hmm. grow, uh, at, uh, going to agriculture of livestock and all those things so that they mm -hmm. can reduce their dependence on the mm -hmm. bush meat mm -hmm. and also for income. Yeah, just a hint again. Eh? Yeah. Livestock cannot grow in the rainforest because of setse. Yes. So remember that. So this is an option for savanna areas or for mountain areas like Rwanda. Mm -hmm. It's not an option for the rain for the lowland rainforest zone. So maybe there the alternative could be fish, ponds, even poultry. So there's some areas that's why sometimes we think that the solution is out there. For some areas the research is very limited and we still don't have a solution. The other day we were discussing with a colleague about rabbits. How could we maybe 
because rabbits reproduce very fast. You can, they're small, that can easily be smoked and transported. Maybe that's an option for some places. So it needs to be context specific. I think this is really important. Yeah, also in Ghana, there are some, uh, there are some uh, places where they see some monkeys are, they are, as their families. Mm. There's a town in Ghana that uh, they, they eat food and leave the leftovers for the, the monkeys, monkeys to come mm -hmm. and eat overnight because mm. they feel the monkeys are the ancestors. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. So but I mean, some of these beliefs, cultural aesthetic <laughs> beliefs, mm -hmm. can be helpful. Yeah, to help promote animals. conservation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do it by Mm-hmm. Another example, yeah. a comment in, from Congo. Yeah, in my in my country, it is very difficult to to stop bushmeat because lo local the life of local community depend on those resources. What we have to do it's only to to raise local community what they have to to hunt and mm -hmm. to, what they have to to let. That's so, only my, my support and mm -hmm. to regulate it. So regulation is very important and, and in Congo what um, he said is very important also to, to explain because sometimes local communities don't know the difference between two monkeys look very similar. One is endangered and it's forbidden to hunt and trade by international law. The other one it's not endangered. But sometimes they don't even know which one is which one. So raising awareness among local populations about which species are in danger and what, it's very important, so, yeah. Another important point. <laughs> um, I would like to share an experience of uh, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. the, uh, no one is allowed to hunt. Mm -hmm. We have stopped the hunting. Mm -hmm. Because we have a, a few numbers of uh, yeah, resources life. to be hunted. Mm -hmm. But we have put in place different regulation measures, including the um, compensation policy for crop riding. For crop riding, mm -hmm. compensation policy for crop riding, also land use planning. Mm -hmm. So people and also awareness raising, and people uh, have a imp improved mind that they cannot only depend on the mm -hmm. uh, resources near the forest; they can have to go. A way it is allowed to, to live, to stay mm. for settlement and find other way of uh, mm -hmm. alternative ways mm -hmm. of living. So, um, yeah. uh, yes, I was also going to go to the second <coughs> whether it is fair or not. Um, I think uh, being fair or not, it depends on the awareness of people mm -hmm. uh, and the target in terms of conservation, biodiversity conservation and um, uh, landscape management. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think uh, I just want to comment on this. So he was saying that because in Rwanda, uh, I mean, just to put it into context, eh, there's highly populated country, very few uh, natural habitat left, mostly in protected areas, few animals as well. So he was saying that in such a country, it's not possible to regulate hunting because there's not enough. So the solution was to find alternative for the communities. I mean, I agree with him, but I think it's going back to the same thing is context specific. In Rwanda, you're very lucky that you don't have setse. So you can have lots of cows roaming in your already degraded non-forest areas, which in the Congo they cannot do, at least in the areas that are lowland. So this is another. So we need to think about what is possible in our context. So you have an area where we could promote maybe cow rearing or animal rearing, like domestic certain domestic animals might be easier. Maybe in the Congo area, maybe the solution is to promote fishing, smoking fish, and something different. So. I think the point that comes from the discussion is that regulation of hunting is the first step. So maybe not all hunting is illegal. Maybe we just need to regulate it for some species and maybe finding alternatives. So maybe if we can find domestic area and domestic animals, because in our area they can easily be grown, that's something. If domestic animals are not an option, maybe we need to turn into fish, into insects, into something else. Mm -hmm. And I think we want to have a comment from, oh, sorry, from Ben. In yes. About US, one second. That is, sorry, otherwise I just do the talking. Yeah, that's okay. So Aida was uh, kind of talking about her time, experience in the US. Uh, she was in Colorado out west, uh, where hunting is very big. It's a, uh, you know, there are people that they live to hunt, their whole life is about hunting. Uh, and this is not the poor country, eh? Yeah. Uh, and they spend a lot of money on hunting. 
so just as people come here to hunt the big animals that we have in Africa, they also pay a lot of money to go hunt uh, animals in the United States. That's one aspect of it, but actually the much bigger aspect of it is that there's a lot of people that hunt for food in the United States. Mm -hmm. Primarily they hunt deer, uh, which are overpopulated in the United States because we've killed all the predators. Mm -hmm. So we've killed the primary predator, which is the wolf, and the cougar, which is uh, kind of like a... A wild cat? A wild cat, kind of like a, a jaguar or like a... a lion without a mane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they call it a mountain lion, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we've killed a lot of them, so now these other animals are overpopulated. So the state, the government, will sell the right to kill a, these, certain, number a certain number of animals. animals. And it's a way for them to help control the populations. And also they get money for the government. And that money is directly used to pay for resource management. Uh, so the, the revenue from hunting permits goes directly back into the system, yeah. the system used for regulating uh, the resources. So it's a fairly good system. There's a lot of obviously conflicts. Um, they're bringing back wolves in some places and some of the hunters are very uh, upset about that. They want to be able to hunt the wolves but they're saying <laughs> they can't hunt the wolves. Uh, the ranchers are upset because the wolves eat their cattle Mouse. and their sheep. Um, so obviously there's conflicts, but again, the money generated from the, from the hunting is a lot and that money is used to help resolve some of those conflicts. I mean, just uh, to add up, uh, in Colorado, because I have a colleague working for the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the kind of the organization that takes care of the protected area, and my colleague was get, saying that they get more money from hunting permits to deliver hunting permits that they get from visitors to national parks. So hunting can be a big thing, even in countries where they have access to other sources of protein. And I think this is something, sorry, one second time. This is something that, uh, especially in Southern Africa, it's, it's been valorized. So they get these numbers of permits that you're allowed to hunt, maybe not elephants, but certain antelopes. And these rich people come over and they pay the permit, which is a lot of money. And this money can be used to manage the area. So, I mean, it's true that I mostly talk about the problem of poor people hunting, but maybe we should also talk a bit more about the opportunity of having these rich people hunting that could, we could potentially valorize to get an income from our protected area, from our forest reserve, from our NGO land or whatever we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Just, Just in, the, in the last, I think two days in the news, there was a comment about um, Botswana and selling permits for elephant hunting. And I think the permits are on the scale of $50,000 for one elephant. Now, that sounds horrible. But it's a lot of money. It's an incredible amount of money. And guess what? In several places, many places, elephants are overpopulated. Um, what about rhinos? Not yet. You know, <laughs> you, you, you prohibit hunting of rhinos, obviously, but the hunters aren't after meat. The poachers aren't after meat, they're after the horn. The horn is hair. Why not cut off the horn? Sell it. I mean, I know it's what I'm idea. saying is heresy in many parts. <laughs> but guess what? If you cut off the horn, nobody kills the rhino. So why not? Mm. And guess what? If you have a rhino with a horn, you are without that, I don't know how much money legal rhino horn would bring mm. in a well-regulated industry. Mm. So I think th there's a point where you have to give up a little bit on those sacred cows, you know, those, those things. That those you, beliefs that you think yeah, it, it should be like that because in I some contexts, yeah, in elephant. some contexts it might be so, I mean, we could valorize on that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. We film, we film you. Mm -hmm. My, the question that comes around hunting, even removing of these animal populations from the ecosystems, is how does removal of an individual affect the animal dynamics vis-a-vis how it will, that will then affect 
the ecosystem. We have seen matriarchs removed from elephant populations and then the remaining elephants run rampage, increasing human wildlife conflict. So that can, those kind of things are the ones we'd want to find out from proper understanding the animal system. Mm -hmm. But I think we go back to the same point. Yes. We might not know enough about yeah. the dynamics of some of these animals, even elephants yeah. are pretty well studied, to be able to determine a good management intervention. Yeah, so I think it's going back to the same point. I mean, to be able to manage something, we need to know not just mm -hmm. what we have, but how it behaves yeah. to make an accurate uh, suggestion. Yeah, so let's move on, because I have a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So now I, went, I gave you examples of three non-timber forest products. The medicinal plants, we talked quite a bit about it. The second one was the indigenous fruit trees. And you know me, I like plants a lot, eh? but I thought we should also talk a little bit about an animal. That's why I discussed bushmeat. And now I want to put it into a bigger context, because um, the other day we had the introduction to ecosystem services and I just want to give a hint um, on something that it's important to think when we talk about ecosystem services. So as uh, Amelie said the other day, there's generally classified in four groups, the provisioning services, regulating, supporting and cultural. And um, you'll have the slide, this is a very good website to have more documents, the TEP project on uh, ecosystem services, how to value them and so on. And um, so the non-timber forest products would fall into which category? Yes? Provisioning. Provisioning. Good. Just checking you're not asleep yet. Eh? So. Mm -hmm. so when we value ecosystem services, it's very important to consider two factors. The scale that we are discussing and to whom. So ecosystem service is important to whom? At the country level? at the regional manager, a protected area manager, or the local people. And I want to give you some, um, I want to show you some results of my research, just to make you think a little bit about this. So I think at the end of the spectrum, I mean, the opposite sides of the spectrum, we have kind of the communities and the more um, high level policy makers. And, uh, I think here you learn to uh, value ecosystem services mostly in two sides, the ecology of them, so where they are, a bit like we did with the carbon, where is the carbon found, how much we have, and also in the economy, okay, how much money this means, if we want to talk about a carbon project, for example. But I want to raise the point that in the, um, we've been increasingly realizing that it's not just about the ecology side, then the economy side. It's also very important to think about the socio-cultural context. So socio-cultural approaches to ecosystem services are those that use methods from social sciences, like interviews, and they value the ecosystem services. Sorry, I wrote ES. ES is usually used to simplify ecosystem services, generally with non-money, just maybe ranking exercise, what is more important to you and why. And, uh, make the stakeholders the center of this research, this, this question of ecosystem services to whom. And of course, if we think about the broader context, when we make management interventions, doing this, I'm not saying doing it alone, I'm just saying complementing your ecology research or your economic research with a little bit of the sociocultural can help you especially value the cultural ecosystem services that are really hard to find. You know, you cannot download a database with the cultural ecosystem services. Eh? It's a little bit difficult. Maybe you can get a number of tourists, but it's a little bit harder. It also helps you understand the interactions between the ecology and the people living in the system, what we call the socio-ecological system. It makes the relevance of the assessment more acceptable in the local context and possibly as well the policy. So when we turn it into a higher level, this makes more sense. So the stakeholder values about ecosystem services, ecosystems in general and the benefits that we derive from it, depend on various things. One of it is the social context. So what is our cultural background? So you know me, I told you, eh, I don't eat caterpillars. Eh? So I would never think it as an ecosystem service. <laughs> like my colleagues, my Samburu colleagues in Kenya don't eat fish. They don't even care about it. So they would never think that this is an ecosystem service. Also about our social network. So not just what we do ourselves, but how we are connected. So 
Maybe some of these people that I mentioned before, these richer people living in urban areas in Africa, they don't like bush meat too much, but it looks good. It looks fancy to show that you can afford it. So it also depends on your network. It also depends on your personal characteristics, how much money you have, your education, your gender, your age, and where you live. So I think because me, I was raised up in, next to a forest, that's why I always got interested to forest. But if you uh, were raised up in a city, maybe you never thought about issues such as, yeah, I don't know, mushrooms or caterpillars, and the interaction between stakeholders. So this is a study from Southeast Asia, Saudi et al. 2010, that showed that communities living near the forest and uh, poor people find more ecosystem services but also educated people, because of course when you have formal education, there's other ecosystem services like carbon that local communities may not know about, but you know about them. So I want to show you, uh, this is preliminary results. They're not out there, but I think it's really interesting. So we asked these expert surveys, uh, sorry, these experts, and we define expert as a person that makes decision about an area. It could be a protected area manager, it could be the local representative of a ministry. So something, somebody pretty high up in decision making in the context. This is done in Africa. And we did it in, uh, if I remember correctly, 20 mountains uh, with forest around Africa. And we asked these experts about their ecosystem. They make, they're the ones making the decisions. Eh? Mm -hmm. So we asked them, oh, what are the most important ecosystem services for local people at the local level? Eh? And I think uh, you can see some of them. I just put the beginning of the table. Eh? You know, water is very important. This was about mountain forests, the forest found in mountains. Water is important, biodiversity, medicine came pretty high up, firewood, charcoal, tourism, whatever, timber. And I thought it was really funny that somebody even dared to mention carbon storage important for local people. I thought, serious? And if you look here, you can see some regional differences. For example, those working in East Africa, they barely mention medicinal resources. And I thought, oh, maybe you have better access, access to um, Western medicine there. And also, if you look at bushmeat, also it was less mentioned in um, East Africa compared to Central and West Africa. I mean, just to give you an idea, eh? I mean, this is uh, the expert, what they think is important at the local level. Eh? So for local people, is biodiversity is important. I would challenge that too, eh? Probably more the provisioning system. Yes, Tom? This is the expert answering for the local uh -huh. people. Uh-huh. What the expert thinks is important for the communities. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then, it will go, then it will go to the communities, that exactly. Uh-huh. So then, I, then we ask them, what is important at the regional level? You know, you are a decision maker. Mm -hmm. So what is important at the region? So beyond your protected area or your ranch or whatever. And then it changed, of course. Water was also very important, but then timber came higher, or maybe um, carbon storage were also coming higher as at the regional level. And, uh, but I still thought it was interesting that they say aesthetic value is very important at the regional level. And to me, it's like, well, if you cannot turn it into money by tourists or something, it might be hard to justify, isn't it? It's just to show you a little bit the ideas eh? about what the expert thinks is important at the local level versus the more regional level. Then, uh, what about the local people? Mm -hmm. Do you think it would be similar? No, no. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to show you the results from three case studies, three of these mountains. We actually went to the ground and asked the people what do they think was important for them. Well, actually, what they said it was important. So the three mountains, one is in Western Cameroon, and you just, uh, I put a couple of pictures so you have a little bit of a context. So this one is quite dry, as you can see the grass is dry. People, uh, they are pastoralists and farmers. Pastoralists are Fulani, they have uh, goats, cows and horses, and at the back of the first picture you can see the farms of the farmers living in the area. Okay. Yeah. People are farming up there. Yeah, me too, I was surprised. Eh? Okay. <laughs> yeah, me too, I was surprised. So soil erosion is big, eh? yeah. you can see. Mm -hmm. So just as a hint, this forest has a few endemics, like for example, there's an endemic frog living in this lake. Eh? So this is still high biodiversity priority conservation area. The second example comes from across the border. So Monkawuzi and Itombe Mountains, much wetter compared with Cameroon, as you can imagine. 
And here we have two communities, so we always ask two different types of communities. Eh? So the idea is to show that even among local people, there's differences that you need to consider. So here the local communities are farmers, uh, cassava, also banana, and then we also have the pygmy hunter-gatherers, which as you might already imagine, might have different priorities to the farmers. Then we go to northern Kenya, so here they are pastoralists, but still from different tribes, different tribes of pastoralists. And uh, here the issue is droughts and how your cattle numbers die in huge numbers after every time there's a big drought. And I think it's really cool to see uh, this first picture. You can see the forest and the desert. So you can already start to think which may be the ecosystem services provided by this forest. Why would you think in this picture would be the most important? Who? Second. Number one? Death. If we live in the desert, there's one thing that is more precious than world. Water. 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 Mm -hmm. So, the first results from Cameroon. So, you can see that there's some uh, services, ecosystem services that were mentioned by both groups. The, in this case, it was the farmers and the pastoralists. So everybody may talk about how important is the forest for firewood, for medicine, for poles, for water, for honey, for mushrooms, and for fodder. The farmers here also have some animals, that's why they mention fodder. And it was really interesting to see how there were some differences as well. The farmers mentioned how important is the forest for carving, and to make ceremonies, and the turaco feathers. So turaco, <laughs> bear money, turaco, uh, turn my correct my pronunciation. So this is this beautiful bird, also endangered, endemic to the area, that has these red feathers on the tail. So the, the one of the tribes there, the Oku, they use the leaf, uh, sorry, the leaves, the feathers of this bird, they put it in the hat, and now you know that me, I'm from the royal family. <laughs> <laughs> so I never thought about that, but actually this is super precious to them because it's your social status depends on having excessive accessibility to these feathers. So they actually protect the birds, they don't kill them, eh? Because they know that if the birds disappear, what are they going to do? I guess they'll have to find something else. But you know, it's interesting to see how different cultures value different things, eh? And in this case, they're also a dry mountain, as you've seen in the picture. So water was the most important they get from the forest. The second one differed between the two groups. We can see the, the pastoralists, the second most important was father. But for the farmers, it was medicine and honey. So for them, getting medicine from the forest and honey is very important. So we go to Congo now. So here, so in Cameroon, seven ecosystem services were cited by everybody. In Congo, 11. So the same firewood, medicine, poles. We see bushmeat, eh? even the farmers talk about bushmeat here, caterpillars. Not just the hunter-gatherers eat caterpillars, farmers also eat caterpillars there. And very interestingly, they talk about microclimate regulation and air purification. As you can imagine, eh, these local people didn't talk about that. They just said, the forest attracts the rains. Mm -hmm. So they might not have our scientific knowledge and background, but they understand that keeping the forest is important to keep the rains coming and the place being cold, nice and humid. And of course, this has an implication if you are a farmer because your crops depend on rains. So for the farmers, they rank microclimate regulation as the most important ecosystem services in the two mountains, everybody. But the hunter-gatherers, they said bush meat and honey is the most important they get from the forest. Because if you are a farmer, your staple food is either maize or cassava, most likely cassava. But if you are a hunter-gatherer and you don't have a farm, your staple food is actually bushmeat, even if it's illegal. So now we go to northern Kenya. So here there were also seven services cited by the different groups of pastoralists. Remember they are all pastoralists but they're a little bit different. So they talk about water, as you already get from the other picture. The forest attracts the rains, we get poles and firewood, we get medicines, we get wild fruits. So wild fruits are very important here in times of droughts when there's nothing else to eat, and fodder. As I said, they're pastoralists. And it was very interesting because I was surprised to see this difference. Why 
The Borana pastoralist mentioned that firewood was more important than fodder if your livelihood strategy is pastoralist. Any ideas? <laughs> yes, sorry, Jessica. Uh, for me, I'm thinking, is it because they border the Chalbi, so wood energy would be completely in the Borana side a serious resource? Uh huh, yeah. it's a talent. One of the reasons is because they live at the edge of the desert, so there's not a lot of trees. But actually, I mean, I went into it and I asked, so what is really the reason that it's even more important than your cows? You know, you guys, you need to have eight cows to marry a lady, you need to have 15 to be a chief, and what, it's all about cows. Why firewood now is so important? And they told me that in their culture, and I don't know, you may know about this already. So in any household, when they wake up, they said the fire, the woman sets the fire. Even if she has no water to make tea or no milk to warm up to drink, for them when they wake up, the first thing is to set the fire. And this is a sign in their culture to show that the household is alive and is doing well. Even if they'll go starving, they still set the fire. Serious. But you know, it's just to show how important is culture when we value and use ecosystems. And I think the idea is just to show you guys that sometimes these experts, eh, that live in an area, and you are experts of your own area and your own countries. Sometimes we forgot about what is important for these local people living at the edge of some of these protected areas that we are trying to manage or, or to try to improve better. And I just want to show you this picture as well. I think it's one of my best pictures ever. And it just shows how important is the mountain forest for water. So it's not great in the picture, but the story goes like this. So when you have trees in mountains, and the clouds pass by, the little water of the clouds from the fog get trapped by the leaves of the trees. And this water starts to um, collect and fall down under the tree. So by having these trees in these mountain areas where there's clouds, what we call cloud forests, we trap more water from the clouds. And here you can clearly see how the grass is green under the tree but not outside. So you can clearly see how these mountain forests help provide water to the ecosystems and the local people and knowledge it. So it's not that just local people use provisioning services that I said, eh? they, they're just extracting from the forest. They actually have, a, in many cases, a very good understanding. Maybe not, they would not use the same words we use, but they have a very good understanding on why these trees and this forest is important to keep the healthy ecosystem. And you can see the very happy donkey eating the fresh grass there. So when we value ecosystem services, eh, I mean, of course, you're going to learn to use the more economic approach and the more ecological approach. But as you are experts of your environments and of your fields and your area, I just want you to remember that it's very important to think about the ecosystem service important to whom. Because what might be important for you at, a more, at the scale of a regional level or the country level might not be the same as you just think a considered important at the local level. So very often local people highly value non-timber forest products. That's what we've been talking about before. And also the second point is that the local communities are not the same. So different tribes, different people, or even livelihood strategies use natural resources in different ways. So it's important to understand the culture of these people to understand what's happening. Then the, the next one is that they just not, local people not only value provisioning things, what you get from the forest, they actually value the, and they have an understanding of the functioning of the ecosystem. They don't call it microclimate regulation, they call it we, the forest attracts rain. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. And then also that by including this more sociocultural uh, part of the, our ecosystem service assessment, we can capture some of these uh, ecosystems that are not considered in mainstream. You know, in the website I showed you in the beginning before, let me just see if it's there. The TEP website. You can go also to the Million, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment website. You know, you can look at many of these websites for the list of what are the ecosystems, how do you classify them, how can you value them. And I can tell you, eh, you will not find forest shelter during conflict as an ecosystem service for forests. But this can be very important. Eh? Go and ask the people living next door in the Air Congo what they were doing during the two Congo wars. Go and ask people in Sierra Leone what they were doing during the Civil War. 
forest was very important, even in northern Kenya, where there's tribal conflict, people go to the forest and hide where things are going wrong. Mm -hmm. And not just hide, eh? you also harvest the fruits, you may harvest the meat, if you are eating meat or not. So it's very important to think a little bit outside of the box. And I just want to say that because, in a way, you are the ones making the decisions or making help make these decisions. So it's good to think not just what is mainstream, but what is important at your local level, at your context. So context is very important, so remember about that. So I just want to give you the last exercise of today, at least for my side. Eh? And uh, maybe I give you like also like three or four minutes to think about it. And then, uh, and then maybe we can uh, hear a couple of comments from different places. As we are lucky to have people from all over Africa. So what do you think? Think about one protected area. If possibly one that is famous, eh? so the other people in the room will know about it. So our Tanzanian colleague will talk about the Serengeti, we already know. What is the three most important ecosystem services for local people and for the managers? I mean, it's more trying to exemplify the local level and more of a large scale decision making. And you will see that often they're not the same. So there might be a trade-off, there might be a conflict of interest that we need to deal with, we need to address as decision makers. So I'll give you three minutes and then we just talk about it. 